Hello, I'm Chuck Martin, and welcome to the Voices of the Internet of Things podcast. With me today is Brett Greenstein, Vice President, Watson Internet of Things Consumer Business at IBM. Brett has held several senior positions at IBM as Vice President of Rational Software for Engineering, VP of CIO and IT Transformation, and leading IBM growth markets in China. Brett joins me at the IBM Genius of Things event in Boston. Welcome, Brett. Thank you very much. So you've got consumer in your title. Tell me where consumer fits in all of this. Uh, the consumer experience is changing the way enterprises think, and because of IoT, now there's an enabled, it's enabled a new level of engagement with users that never existed before. There was a time, not that long ago, and for the previous hundred years, where you built something, shipped it to someone, and then never heard from the user again. You don't know what features are used, you don't know where it's used, how, if the person's even happy with it, if it's even working. Um, before IoT, since IoT, these things are live and they're providing data and feedback all the time. And it means we have a new way to reach consumers and engage with them that never existed before. So do they need a smart device for that? Um, it's almost hard to avoid a smart device. So increasingly in almost every part of our lives, things are becoming connected. Um, started with televisions. You know, it was not that long ago a smart TV cost $400 more. And it was wired into your ethernet if you had that. And, um, you know, and now, Every TV is a smart TV. You can't buy one that isn't, and they're cheaper than the, even the dumb TVs were just a few years ago. And it's happening to our thermostats, to our lights, to our appliances, to our cars. So yes, you need a smart device, but you also won't be able to avoid one. So, so how do you tap into smart devices then? Well, where does IBM fit in that? Well, a couple different places. One is we have an IoT platform, which is a cloud-based set of services that make it easy for manufacturers to connect to our platform and then get the data and the engagement information and the performance of things into the cloud where we can perform analytics, we can apply cognitive algorithms to it, we can learn from that data and provide new uses and new applications. So what are some examples of that? Um, you'll see that, for example, with Whirlpool Appliances, working with Whirlpool to bring their data into our cloud to help do predictive maintenance, understand which features and functions are used in appliances, and drive a better user experience for the customers. So, so does the consumer see that, or, or how do they see it? So there's two sides to what we do. One of them you'll see, the manufacturer will see. So connecting our things into the cloud so the manufacturers can better manage and maintain those things and learn from them is somewhat invisible to the user. But then we've begun enabling uh, Watson services in connected things to directly engage with consumers. So here we're doing work. Um, you probably saw uh, almost a year ago we announced some work with Local Motors, the self-driving car, and we brought Watson into the car, talking to people and engaging with users to say where you want to go, asking about the weather, just dialogue-driven kind of stuff. And then we've continued that experience in hospitals like Thomas Jefferson University Hospital, and now we're working with hotels and automakers um, to do this at scale. So, and it's all about driving um, new engagement through voice with users um, in much deeper settings than you might see in a lot of off-the-shelf kind of stuff. So, so in, in terms of uh, doing this with the car, what, what do you need to do to make that happen? Um, as a manufacturer or as a user? Well, that, well, the whole process from, uh, you've, got the, you've got the autonomous vehicle, mm -hmm. How do you, what's the process to get Watson and, and basically intelligence into the car? Yeah, so we bring, we bring it in kind of a hybrid approach. There's a set of capabilities you have to have some level of connectivity. Um, you've got to have some ability to have microphones and stuff in the car to be able to engage with people. More sensors is better, but um, voice at a very minimum. Um, and most of the cars are now including microphones and, and infrastructure to do that. We have a hybrid kind of approach. We have some offline voice capability, so that no matter where you are, no matter what your connectivity, you can do basic things. But much of the value of this comes from the outside data in the world and doing that through the cloud. So connected vehicles is obviously a good enabler of the deeper use cases. For example, um, a red light goes on on your dashboard. You know, yes, that's a good thing to tell you something's wrong, but should I worry? Do I need to get it fixed right now? Is my car going to break? Is it going to be expensive to fix? These are things that if you can connect to the cloud, manufacturers can feed that information to us and let us know, it's a red light, don't worry, there was a recall on this, and, if you, and I'll schedule an appointment for next Tuesday. Does that sound good? And it's not going to cost you anything. And suddenly now the worry is gone. I can drive to my destination, and the car helped me live better. This is the kind of engagement through voice and, and, and connectivity that we can do. So that example, it strikes me that the consumer has no idea that this is Watson or AI. So they may not know it's Watson. Some, some companies that we work with will brand with Watson. Others will have it embedded behind some other experience. Um, you'll hear a company at our Genius of Things event today called Chameleon, who um, builds um, energy management systems in homes in the UK. 
and they have a device that has their own branding. It's powered by Watson um, and allows you to interact with it and help save energy in the home. It's okay with us if people have their own brands. The important thing is that we're bringing the cognitive experience, enabling true understanding of consumers, and tying it into connected things and, and transforming business. So from a consumer standpoint, do they simply get uh, one improvement and then another one, then another? So it's like boiling frogs kind of thing, and all of a sudden they're living in a connected world? Yeah, it's already happening. We're already boiling, I guess. Um, it's already happening. So it started with, you know, certainly in our homes with televisions and the occasional lights and things like that. But now it's not just what we buy as individuals, although we'll, as we refresh our, our things in our lives, they're becoming connected things. Your cars are connected. You don't have to even pay extra. It's just kind of part of that. But um, beyond that, all the companies are leveraging connected things to deliver service. I'm working with a lot of companies working on like aging in place solutions or home safety solutions where you may pay a monthly fee and they'll bring a device into the home to help you manage that. In the case of Chameleon with Energy, there's a device that comes with their service and helps you interact and learn how to save money on your energy usage. So in some cases, service providers will be bringing things into our lives. In other cases, we'll be buying things that are increasingly connected. Um, and then pretty soon, the water's boiling and we're all living in a very connected world. We won't be able to remember what it was like before that happened. And does generations have a play in here? They do. Um, but not, not as simple and binary as you might think. I mean, certainly um, millennials are, are much more attuned to what's happening in mobile and more open to sharing their data in a way that might provide new use cases. But at the same time, we're finding a tremendous amount of interest from, you know, for example, the aging in place solution I mentioned earlier. This is for a whole generation to help take care of their parents to be able to live at their home longer and for all of us to have less fear and worry about that. There's also working parents looking at how to help and manage their kids. So now there's a whole set of people who are, you know, two parents working, kids at school, a lot of worry when they come home, are they doing their homework, is everything okay? Um, there are telcos we're working with who are simply worried about pets that bark too much or not. So all these kinds of services are all integrated home things that affect every generation. I do think there's a difference in how people respond to voice-driven stuff um, and, uh, and mobile applications and sensors. Um, but I think because the, the technology is becoming so consumer-friendly, um, you know, it's stuff sold in Bed Bath & Beyond. There's a whole section for just IoT. I don't think it requires geeky, you know, hard wiring and coding anymore. Um, it's more about how it delivers value. And I think people are very open to value. So do you see a, a split in the market where some people are saying, I love this kind of stuff connected, and other people are saying, I don't want anyone to know anything about me. Oh. I, I, I mean, look at Easy Pass. Not yeah. everybody has Easy Pass, for example. Right. Um, it's absolutely true. There's a, there are definitely a set of people who are terrified about, about their privacy. I think people should expect companies who are privacy-centric. One of the things about IBM is everything we provide, we don't own your data. So we, our customers own the data. And those customers, whatever brands they are, establish trust with their, with their users. There are a lot of companies right now delivering you know, consumer AI kind of systems where they do, they're, they're solely doing it for the sole purpose of collecting your data to market it and sell your data. I think as users, we should expect privacy and we should work with companies we trust. Um, whether it's IBM or companies that we, we service who are also trusted companies. Um, but I don't think you should be inviting cameras and sensors into your home if you're not working with a company who values and trusts and can assure privacy. And, and do consumers know that yet, or is that an education process? It's education. There's a lot of fear still among this, but I think the same kind of fear existed when microwave ovens came out, when Wi-Fi came out. It's not uncommon um, to worry about this stuff, and I think it's up to companies to assure us through their business model, through their public statements and through their technology that they are committed to this. IBM published a set of principles about AI that we were going to um, not use your data without telling you how it's going to be used. We're going to be fully transparent. You know, this is these are principles that companies should stand behind because there's a huge responsibility with all this insight about our lives that can easily be abused. I also think just like the internet itself, when people started doing commerce on the internet. Everybody freaked out about using their credit card over there. And there was even a bunch of stories. You give your credit card to a waiter or waitress, but you won't give it to an online store. Um, and it's true, you're giving away in both cases. It's just easier to replicate you know, online. But then credit card companies came out with protection. Um, security protocols improved. 
And while we worry about this, we didn't stop doing commerce. And I think the value that IoT and AI bring will be so transformative to people that living without it will be harder. Just like living without Easy Pass is quite difficult now. There's fewer lanes, the weights are longer. Nobody has change anymore. So um, living without a system to take care of us, to keep an eye on us, keep on our family, is it's going to seem very tedious. Right. Know, we well, in, in some cases, it also gets forced. Like in, in Massachusetts, for example, they took out all the toll booths. Yeah. So if you don't have Easy Pass, you pay a premium. They, they zap your license plate. Yeah. They know who you are. Dollar. I, I saw that. <laughs> So you really, it will, there's a turning point that will come where it's simply living is better with systems that support you and help you. But I don't think we're going to be forced into systems that invade our privacy. I think we'll have a lot of market choices. And I hear that already from a lot of companies who simply don't want to give all their data to some closed ecosystem. They want to manage that data and build a trusted relationship with their customers. And so companies like IBM can help them do that. Right, so what you, you've been at IBM for a long time. Yeah. Uh, what, what have you seen in terms of, just, just in, I'm just curious, because I used to be at IBM many years ago. Oh, okay. uh, so what, what have I'm you seen? I'm second generation IBM, so my entire life on earth has been with IBM in some way or another. I used to come in with my father on weekends and help him make charts. And you know, I, I used to get toys from IBM where the scraps from manufacturing were my toys as a kid. Um, but the, the beauty of that is getting to see the forest for the trees, to see how businesses shift and transform when we resisted technology and when we dove in and embraced it. And the effect it had on our business. Like the net, for example. Like the net. There was a time well, you could see it from the PC. There was a huge resistance to the PC, and it was a rebel faction in IBM that said, we must do this. And then doing it created an entire industry of mid-market offices, all automated and all this, and created dynasties with other companies. Um, the net was a similar thing. We, we resisted for a short time, but Gerstner, as he came in, he said something that struck me. I was, I was watching on a monitor in the hallway, and he said, it was a network and interop conference or whatever. He said, everyone on the internet is talking to servers, we know servers. And it just stopped me in my tracks. I'm like, oh my God, we have not just a role, but a critical role to play in delivering a scalable, secure internet. So he defined our role in there and it shaped the, the company. And I think now, as we look at IoT and AI, we have also declared our role in helping companies to transform their business with it. We're not the consumer device company. We're not the network company. We are the company that helps other companies to transform with IoT, to do supply chains better, to engage with their users in new ways, to build better products. Um, it's where our depth is strong, our industry domain knowledge is powerful, our analytics is strong, and scale um, it helps us do that. Um, are you looking at, at consumer packaged goods at all, or, or thinking about that in terms of yeah. connected products, basically? Yeah, we enable companies who build connected products, and so we're working with quite a few companies to make their products better. Um, one of the patterns that seems to be quite strong is helping those companies to deliver products that engage with users so they can learn more about their users or deliver more value to those users. So we're talking to electronics companies and working with them on, on ways that they can bring you know, cognitive capabilities into products. Um, some companies who are building um, packaged products that, um, for example, have acoustic analytics in them, they can listen to the sounds of your home or factory or somewhere else and um, understand what the sound is from patterns and profiles and, and using AI. So we can train it to listen for the sounds like in your home of broken glass, crying babies, barking dogs, and maybe help you keep an eye on your family better by understanding what's happening in the home. We do similar things with image analytics and stuff. So tons of ways we can bring cognitive capabilities into packaged products that are delivered at all kinds of price points. Yeah. I have Mohammed. He only has until 1.30. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, in terms of packaged goods, any thoughts of things like, like the P&Gs like the of the world where, I mean, they would love to know when their ketchup goes in the refrigerator or whatever product, how yeah. often does it use, when is it empty, is it used, is it thrown away? Yeah. So far, as the price points drop, what, what you're seeing is kind of transitional technologies. Right now, a lot of the focus is on like vision systems and refrigerators to see usage patterns or barcode scanners and stuff. But you can feel that it's transitional, that eventually the product packaging itself will be smart enough that it'll tell things what's happening. We're just, I think the price points are still dropping. Ketchup packets are not expensive enough to merit the hardware in there. Um, but you're seeing it more on other consumables in products. You know, you're more likely to see toner cartridges and printers self-report than maybe ketchup packages, but it's inevitable. 
I mean, we're talking about smart tattoos that, that have electronics in it. So it's the, the price is plummeting, and the tipping points are there as the infrastructure's in place, um, and platforms like ours are able to absorb all that data, then having a smart packaging is I inevitable. Great. Brett Greenstein, thank you very much, and thank you all for listening to the Voices of the Internet of Things. Thank you.